Hey, hey, Donna Price here. Welcome to Visionary Womenpreneurs Radio. I am thrilled that you're here. I am your host, Donna Price. And today I have the extraordinary opportunity to sit down with Nicole Whitauer. Nicole has always, has always had a deep love of art and creativity, using it as a means to access the right side of the brain and tap into the subconscious. Through her art and playfulness, Nicole has created maps to understand complex concepts and inspire others. She has a unique vision of creating a user manual for the brain. And her journey has been shaped by various experiences and stepping stones. Nicole believes in giving oneself permission to play and explore without fear of failure, surrounded by supportive playmates who encourage exploration. Her ultimate goal is to bring the power of play back into the lives of both children and adults. Yay. And um, it's quite the interview. So join us as we dive into Nicole's fascinating insights on the importance of play, embracing the unknown, and finding alignment in our own unique paths. I think this episode is going to inspire you to, to reconnect with your own inner wisdom and unlock new possibilities through the power of play. Just a little bit more about Nicole. She's a visionary artist, author, and solution-focused coach, specializing in creating insightful and transformative playgrounds for self-exploration and discovery. With over 12 years of experience in team building and Lego serious play facilitation, combined with a lifelong journey of exploration through art and spirituality, Nicole has developed a unique approach to helping individuals uncover their true selves. Through her astonishing coloring books, games, and introspective journeys, Nicole brings playfulness and transformation to all who engage with her work. Her clients include award-winning entrepreneurs, coaches, healers, young adults, and parents, all seeking to break ancestral patterns, overcome limiting beliefs, and embrace an extraordinary life experience. So join me on this incredible journey with Nicole Whitauer. Nicole, welcome to Visionary Womenpreneurs Radio. I am so excited to have you here to talk about the importance of play and how you have integrated that into your business as the main focus of your business. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Great. Looking so forward to it. Let's start with like, where the idea came from and the original inspiration for your business and how you kind of got where you are. I know that's a big question, so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, it is a big question because, you know, there's so many little stepping stones and it's really hard to say which one was the decisive one, right? Because there are all these tweaks going on. Um, but I'd say there's sort of two steps. One is going into the sort of the coaching business, right? I used to be at corporate. I used to be a project manager. And then one day I was working in this company and I just couldn't connect to my boss. He was a really bad boss in terms of connecting people. A nice guy, you know, but just the whole group, nobody knew who was doing what, what we were trying to do together. And I was really trying to help him. And all my project management tools of connecting people, you know, being the middleman who makes people understand each other, it just really didn't work. I didn't understand what was going on. So I thought maybe I need some new tools and I looked into facilitation. And as I was looking into facilitation, I also discovered coaching, but I still wanted to do the facilitation. And I, I looked at these different courses and one of them was about Lego serious play. And it was just like that just attracted my eye. And I just thought, Ooh, I get to play. Right. So that was sort of, the first moment where this playfulness really tickled me and thought, oh, you know, getting people to understand each other, to communicate better through something that's playful, where I get to play, that's what I want to learn how to do. Yeah. So I kind of went into facilitation and coaching at the same time and, and completely changed, you know, my business. I thought I was just learning tools for my work. And that's when I actually decided to quit the job get coaching certification, get the facilitation certification and and start that journey. But the so the play has always been part of my 
my toolkit, but now I'm sort of stepping more into, no, let's make it all about play. Let's not just make it a toolkit. Let's show people how powerful play is because that's what I learned in the last 12 years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. My background, I um, facilitated high ropes courses and we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between icebreakers and play. Um, but one group that I was involved with, like really did focus on like, let's play, like, let's have fun. And, and um, I envy that you're still doing that work because I'm not really <laughs> doing that work anymore, but I do believe that play is so important. So in starting your business, um, like what's the big vision as you move forward for getting people playing? And we're talking about adults. We're not necessarily talking about kids. And so. Yeah, well, I mean, like the, the long-term vision, the long-term vision is actually really to to come back to children as well, to use play as a way of teaching them tools that are more coaching tools, that are more self-discovery tools. But that's sort of in the, really down the road. Right now, what I am focusing on is adults bringing that playfulness, playfulness back in because um, play being such a powerful tool, we have it as kids, right? We we know how to play. That's That's the first thing we do. Because nature kind of gave that to us to learn, right? It's it's the nature's way of 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 learning, of teaching us things. We're going out, we're exploring, and we don't care if it works, if it doesn't work, uh, if you know, if as long as our imagination lets us explore the boundaries of the possible, we're happy. Um, and as adults, as we get into that space where things become serious, right? Oh, we're getting into the real life now. You can't be such a kid anymore. Stop playing. You know, you're going to have to learn how to make money. You have to choose the right kind of um, job that you're going to be happy with. All of a sudden, there's so much um, so much at play in terms of, of expectations and risk of failure. And what if we choose the wrong thing? <clears throat> and um, And that's when we lose the whole playfulness. Yeah. And with the play, we lose exploration. We lose um, a lot of uh, experimentation as well. You know, Einstein said um, play is the highest form of research. And yeah. it is. <clears throat> it is. So it's about reconnecting adults with play because it just opens up the possibilities of finding solutions of daring, of finding courage. We had courage when we were kids, right? We went out and we did stuff. Now we're scared. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's about helping them reconnect with that so that they find a deeper connection to who they are, deeper connections to other people, de deeper connections to their path and, and just have a more fulfilling and, and aligned life experience. Really. That's, that's where I'm going with this is, is helping them connect to that inner knowledge through play. Because it's there. It's always been there. It's just that we've put so many layers of shoulds and stuff. Responsibility on that, and, yeah. yeah, responsibility, exactly. That we forget that that's an innate, there's an innate knowledge and wisdom there that we just don't go and explore anymore. Definitely. I think it helps to have kids sometimes because then you like, you play with your kids and you're like, oh, I remember doing this. And, um, but, so yeah. let's talk about what the difference is between games like icebreakers that you're doing like in corporate events or that we would do on a ropes course and the kind of play that you're talking about, because it sounds different. Well, the icebreakers that I've been in contact with um, and, and maybe, you know, I'd be interested in hearing what kind of icebreakers you used or how you felt about the icebreakers, but the ones that, um, I experienced were usually the ones that you do at the beginning of a session, a team building session, or where people don't know each other or don't know each other very well, to sort of put them at ease, right? To make them feel a little more comfortable, to relax a bit and let their guard down a bit, which is a very powerful part of play, right? It's about, oh, I don't need to, you know, pretend that I'm strong and professional. I can get a little silly here. 
Um, the kinds of games that I would design for the corporate world had a very specific goal of um, reaching a connection that was at a deeper level. So it was about taking the problems of the of the team and rather than saying, okay, now we need to dissect this, see what's going on, you know, confront the thing, uh, you know, bring all the dirty laundry out that's going to get everybody, <laughs> everybody's knickers in a twist and, you know, potentially create drama here. <clears throat> We're actually going to set ourselves in a parallel kind of world, in a different world where something similar exists, but it's far away from home that it doesn't feel personal and it doesn't feel like, you know, we're under attack or anything, but we're taking scenarios that sort of resemble without it being too obvious. Yeah. And because we're then all of a sudden in a playful environment, whether we're using Lego, whether we're imagining that we're on a different planet, um, now we're just exploring on a playground. Right. And here we don't have to worry because, OK, this isn't personal. It's not about us. We're, we're in this imaginary world. And without even noticing, they're starting to commit to to trying to find answers, to trying to explore new ways, to looking at other possibilities, because, you know, in this imaginary world, all is possible. That by the end of the day, they realize that not only have they found solutions in the weirdest places that they can then bring back into the real world and into their situation, but they've connected at a much deeper level because they were really, really playing. Right. And, and um, so there's this, people come out of these sessions to fully engaged, you know, there's no resistance. It's so hard to say no to play, yeah. right? You don't, you don't sort of sit back and say, uh, I don't want to play. <laughs> yeah. Well, some so people try to do that, but they quickly get pulled into the group. Yeah, yeah. You just sort of, I've had a guy once when I got my, my very first Lego series play session, you know, I asked people in the beginning, has everybody, you know, played with Lego before and so forth. And he sort of took the stance and say, I'm an adult, you know, my child plays with Lego, but I don't, you know, it's a sort of like, you know, trying. but the moment that the box of Lego was set in front of him, because everybody gets their own set and they're all the same Lego, you know, it's very hard not to take them in your hands and just sort of you know, start putting them together. It's 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 really hard, especially everybody else is diving in because it reminds them of their childhood and they're, oh, you know, oh, and look at that. I've never seen this piece before. And they're already playing before you even give them something to do. Yeah. And so um, at the end of the session, he was just like, you know, it was amazing how he was transformed. There was no way he could resist. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think bringing people into that um, novel environment like that's different from like it, the dynamics within the group change but you also see the dynamics that exist and you're able to like work on those in a different way than in your traditional like work environment and it makes it so powerful for people because they're like in this other place and they're able to say things that they wouldn't say at work or Absolutely. identify like communication issues or, you know, like nobody's listening to me. I have an idea or whatever it is um, because they're in this different environment and they would never like raise their hand at work and say, nobody's listening or, or maybe they did and still nobody listened, but all of a sudden here people are listening Absolutely, absolutely. And when, when you design these games, those are parts of the elements you bring in, right? Is that yeah. you find ways for everybody to get the same sort of, um, you know, airtime as such, um, right. because it's part of the game. You know, they don't have to fight for attention. You don't have somebody who, who all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the big extrovert or the, or the boss who steps up front and then everybody sort of falls back. And, and that's what I always loved about designing these games is thinking of all these different details, you know, how to bring everybody into the room, how to make sure the most quiet person would be heard, um, how to, you know, not bring that confrontational energy in where people felt that they had to put up a certain guard or whatever. And I've had 
um, teams that were in such a bad place. Like, you know, people were telling me there's no way that you, this is going to change anything, right? There's yeah. no, like, forget it. It's not worth it. We've been, you know, it's been years. And, and I couldn't believe the amount of sabotage that was going on within the team. It was just, you know, I thought, what, what is this place? But the play just, you know, it was like all that, all those stories about how people thought that other people were, about who's, you know, conniving with who, who's got what agenda, all these stories that were just made up in their minds based on little elements that they were trying to, you know, um, justify. Yeah. That all disappeared. It all disappeared. And um, and a few hours later, they'd walk out like, oh, you know, so relieved that they didn't have to play this other game anymore, which was the game of being angry and the game of not liking someone and the game of, you know, the, all the gossip, which yep. doesn't feel good to anybody, right? Yeah, definitely. So mm -hmm. in your business now, like you're coaching and you have the facilitation certifications, but most coaches are helping people with like goal setting. Like mm. that's part of what I do, like creating your strategic plan and your marketing plan. And, but you have a different approach. So you focus on method rather than outcome. And um, so let's talk about like, your approach versus the more traditional like business coach but life coach also works on goals and success and all that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean th the thing is i tried <laughs> i tried to do it the way that you know we're invited or you know to do it or or, or told to do it as such in terms of okay find a niche you know, define your goal. And everybody is telling me, you know, the play is just, that's just the how that's, you know, nobody's interested in the how they just want to know where they get. And, and I get that, you know, I get that. And I, I see the attraction of that, but I've realized over the years that every time I bought into that kind of thing, especially in marketing, because I'm, I always thought I'm not good at marketing. I'm not good at sales. I need to learn this. Right. Yeah. I would put so much money into these programs only to realize that, you know, and push myself and cringe and think, oh, I don't like this. I don't like the, you know, but I got to do it because this is apparently the only way to do it. And I'd push myself, spend it on me and, and get just before the end and turn around and just drop it all. Because I thought, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this. This is so far away from who I am yeah. <laughs> that I'm getting to a point where I don't like myself anymore. Right. Yeah. I don't know who I've become. And then, you know, a year would go by and I'd say, oh, well, but I got to I got to make an effort. Get, you know, maybe I'll find somebody who's more aligned with who I am. And and I think I'd find someone and I do it again. And I did it over and over and over again. And, you know, I, I, there was such an inner battle about trying to conform. It felt like I was trying to squeeze this this star shaped peg into this, you know, round or square hole. And it just didn't work. And I thought there's there's a lack of alignment between who I am, how I fundamentally feel about what I do, and how people tell me to present it to the world. So I'm going to just embrace my way of doing things for once and speak from the heart. And, you know, I'm someone, I love going on journeys of self-discovery. I don't need to know where I'm going. It's a little bit like like going backpacking. I, I don't like um, these, you know, uh, journeys where you, you go on a cruise and you know each stop and each meal and who you're going to be sitting with each day. <laughs> Some people love that. I don't. I don't, I don't see either. the point of it. I hate it. <laughs> you know, but if somebody says, hey, let's take, you know, three months and, and take a little backpack and we're just going to go around the world or, or explore different areas of the world, but we'll decide where we go once we get to the first place. I say, I'm all in because yeah. that's when magic happens. Because if we focus on this one thing, 
we might not see all the other opportunities that are, you know, presenting themselves because we're just focused on that one particular outcome and we're, you know, really driving to yeah. but, but for people like me who just really love to explore and discover and say, wow, I'm sure there's a whole lot more to me than, you know, meets the eye and, and I just can't manage to fit myself into this, this peg, this hole, whatever that people expect of me. I just want to know more about who I am and how I can connect to that me and how I can right. find those gifts within, then maybe it will, you know, it resonates more to people. And and I have realized that people do react to play now in a very different way than when I just say, oh, I'm a coach and I'm, you know, I'm a life coach and I help you, you know, um, discover who you are. No, we go and we play and we're going to, you know, unearth all sorts of stuff. And then, you know, people's eyes light up. So yeah. Um, I've decided I'm just going to not listen to anything anymore <laughs> from the outside world and listen to myself. That's good. That's good. We all need to listen to ourselves more. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what I do with people. I create that space for them to be able to actually hear their own voices, to yeah. find their own drive, you know, rather than be distracted with all those voices. Um, yeah. So I have to start I, by applying it. <laughs> I did an outward bound course years ago where we were backpacking in Joshua Tree, Tree National Monument. And there was many young men on the course and they were all about the destination, like where we're getting to tonight. And it was a year where they had had more rain in Joshua Tree than they'd seen in decades. So there were flowers blooming that hadn't bloomed in years. And there was three women on the course and we were, two of us at least, we're more interested in like, oh, look at that little flower and those little teeny flowers. <laughs> so you couldn't like walk fast and really see them. And we'd get to camp at night and sit in the circle and they'd be like, you guys are so slow. And <laughs> can't you walk faster? And we we're like, yeah, but there's flowers and there's things to see. And, and um, the day that I was like leader of the day, I was like, all right, we're going to walk fast today. And we walked fast and we got lost and we climbed an extra mountain and we got to camp. I have a picture of these guys like laying with their backpacks, like turtles stuck on their back. <laughs> and we got to the circle that night and they're like, you can walk really fast. And I was like, yeah, I could walk fast. Like, do we need to walk fast? And it was like, finally, like a backing off of, like, yeah, it's not all about the destination, you know, and I've always felt like it's like the journey, like, you know, which is I mean, why I, I love traveling. Backpacking is not really my thing, but bike touring, like that mm. slower way of like, you just see things, you meet people, you talk to people. Like you were saying that you didn't know you were going to run into, you didn't expect. And, um, it's powerful and it you end up going in new directions because of it. it. It it's the unexpected that makes the journey so interesting, isn't it? It's yeah. Because when you when you know what to expect all the way along, the the only thing, the only surprise really is when you're disappointed. <laughs> because <laughs> it didn't quite turn out the way you wanted, right? Because you have these high expectations. But I mean, and and think about those people who who often talk about, you know, who are very, very successful, whether they're actors or musicians and, you know, and they had this drive and they wanted to get to this great place. And then when they got there, they felt empty. Yeah. Right. I think that that's so very telling because it was all about getting there. Right. And then once you're there, you sort of think, well, what's so great about this place? Right. And I've spent months, years, just so focused and pushing, pushing, pushing that in the meantime, I, I didn't connect to family members or I didn't, you know, really experience yeah. all these things that might have come my way. And you no, know, but I think part of it is we we are so desperate for control, for this illusion of control, for knowing, oh, I, if I know where I'm going, then I can prepare and I, you know, my nervous system can be um, calmed down and I don't need to worry, even though we have no idea where we're going, what's going to happen, but it's a nice thought, right? It's a nice feeling. Right. But when you go on backpacking and you know you're backpacking, you know, and, and you sort of say, well, I'm going to embrace 
you know, the people I meet on the bus, you know, if somebody strikes up the conversation, I'm going to learn something about the locals, or maybe there's something, you know, and, and, and you never know. And it's, it's those stories you come home with, right? When you yeah. come home from an adventure, whether you were backpacking or whether you went a cruise, the stories you tell are those that you were not expecting. Yes. Whether they're good or whether they're bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and those are the ones you remember. Yeah. And so why why shut all those doors and and think that I know where I'm going, I got to get there because then you, the pressure is so high. Yeah. You know, because then it's also about choice. What if I make the wrong choice? What if I'm going to put all my energy and all my money and all my time into getting to this place and maybe it's not the right place i'll have wasted all of that all those resources right. but when you play play is all about experimenting and exploring without expectation which means i'm going to go in that direction i'm going to see what i find and depending on what i bump into you know i'll either go left or right or continue straight or or maybe turn around and then go down that tunnel or you know over that bridge but at least I can start moving because I, you know, I know where I'm going in the first instance. And I'm going to go explore that, and um, and maybe there'll be a whole bunch of paths that are a lot more attractive than what I thought that you know I wanted to do. Yeah, but you got to get there first, right? You can't know what's going to come if you always stand where you're standing at the starting block. Right. I think of it like um, like there's been times in my life where I've made what people perceived as bold moves, like quit my job and hmm. move to a different state. And one of the things that happened for me was by doing, by like stepping out of like the path that I was on and jumping to a different path, like doors appeared that I didn't even realize existed. And people were opening them saying, Hey, here's this door, walk through this door. Like, you could do this or, you know, whatever it was. And when we kind of stay in our path, you can only see what, what you can see. Yeah. And when you think about like, there's so many worlds out there, you know, like I'm a cyclist. So there's this cycling world of people that love biking. And within that world, there's all these other, you know, there's mountain bikes and road bikes and racers and, you know, and, but like, we all have all these worlds that we're part of. And when you like step a little bit differently, you see other things that are, you know, possible. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, I think we have to step a little bit back from that paradigm that we've bought into that we've been, you know, conditioned with that, that you have to choose the one path and you have to make sure it's the right path. And, and, you know, Oh, if you don't stay on that path, you're going to lose years or of, you know, investment of, you know, and, and you can't change direction when you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s. And when I look, work with young people, I love working with young people who are either trying to choose what university degree to go into or, or might be questioning their choices or, or don't want to go to university, but there's, you know, parents are pushing or whatever. And they are so worried about making the wrong yeah. choice. And what's interesting is, you know, typically when I was younger, it was always, if you go to university, you open doors, right? That's how you open doors. And I have the feeling by choosing a path, they feel like they're closing doors. Mm, right? Yeah. Because they now we're in that mindset where, you know, you have to be really, really good at one thing. If you do several things, you'll never be good at anything. Yeah. But I believe that what makes people special and unique is when they pursue a number of things, because it's the combination of those things that right. makes them really special. And and it's not as though you're taking energy. It's not linear, right? You don't have a bucket that's, you know, of of 100% of energy and you put 50% here, 50% there, and then neither one's good. It's, for me, there's a synergy. Yes, it's, there's learning in the one pot and there's learning in the other pot that contributes to the advancement in in that, you know, second pot. And when they combine that and embrace the two, it's a bit like going up a ladder. You need two feet. You don't go up a ladder with one foot, you know, and if each foot sort of corresponds to a different 
life, um, let's say, uh, passion or, or choice, each one can build on the other. And this is what I finally decided to embrace with the play, with the art, with the coaching. I'm combining stuff that I'm passionate about in different ways, but that together for me create a, a great space and a great platform. Yeah. You know, and, and everybody's capable when they take these different sides of themselves and, and give themselves permission to explore them and accept them and not put them aside and say, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, stop doing that because otherwise, you know, I won't get professional. What a shame. It's like cutting off an arm. <laughs> you know, it's like, why would you refuse that to yourself? You know, it's it's part of your your genius. Um, yeah. So I just love seeing how people create these incredible combinations of things and 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 thrive with odd things that you know you'd never think yeah i had a guy he was a rapper and an entrepreneur yeah and it's like <laughs> what do i do i said you know just see how they help each other you know yeah. you don't have to be one or the other definitely and you have cool art on your background <laughs> I love. So talk about like the correlation between art and play. So for me, um, the, I've always loved art. I've always been a, an artist, but I put it aside off and on, you know. And um, I think what I why it's coming together is, first of all, because whether you're playing or whether you're doing art, you're accessing a different part of your brain than when you're trying to figure stuff out, right? So you're, you're accessing the right side of your brain, which is the creative side. Yeah. And when you're access, accessing that side, it's like the analytical side says, oh, you're, you're working right now? I'm going to go take a break, right? I'm going to go sit in the lawn chair because I need one. Yeah. And so when that happens, there, you know, all sorts of things. You're creating space. You're creating space in your mind where things can move and other things happen. And then answers can come really easily and you can access more of your subconscious mind than your conscious mind. So through art and through play, I think this connection happens to the subconscious mind and to the creative mind, which is a, a big part of who we are, but we rarely you know, talk to. Yeah. Um, and then art is playful as well. It's an invitation to play, whether it's by coloring, whether it's by doodling, whether it's by drawing. And I I need to draw to understand things. For me, drawing is a way I've noticed to connect to my subconscious mind. So I, I play with my drawings. I yeah. give myself space to connect. Um, and, and it's also a way for me to take complex concepts and ideas and simplify them because I need to see them. If I read them or hear about them, they're still complex. If I draw them, then I understand them. And this is a little bit where this whole maps of life came together is I was drawing these maps for me to understand what I'm trying to you know, conceptualize. And people were looking at my maps and they're saying, oh, now I understand. <laughs> you know, oh, can, can you share that with me? Can you show me those maps? And so the idea is to help people draw their own maps, draw their own sort of manual to their brain. Um, you know, one of, one of these things that I found so uh, sort of a little bit of an aha moment many years ago was I, I bought this watch and it had one button on it, right? I mean, you know, like a watch this. And it came with this really thick little manual in I don't know how many languages, like how to operate the watch. And I was thinking, <laughs> it's a watch. It's got one button. You pull on it and you turn it. Like, what else could it be? And I thought, you know, you get user manuals for the, the simplest devices. Yeah. I want a user manual for my brain. That's what I want. You know, it's the one thing that I would really like to understand, there's no user manual for it. And so that's always been sort of in the back of my mind that this idea that, wow, imagine we created our own little atlas about how our brain works, how our identity works, or where we go in these moments and, you know, whether that serves us, where we want to go instead. And so it's all kind of come together. You know, in the beginning, we were talking about these stepping stones. These are all these little stones, pebbles that have sort of crossed my path and have brought me to doing what I do today. Very cool. So... When you talk about 
like maps of life and using play, like what does that look like when you're working with someone? So part of the idea um, of creating these maps was also to make coaching tools accessible to people who couldn't necessarily pay for coaching, um, you know, one-to-one -one coaching. Yeah. And so I always had this idea of creating this interactive book, whether it's a coloring book or a doodle book or something very interactive, but offline, right? It's like somewhere where you can take the thing, sit under a tree, get your pencils out and just spend some time with yourself. But not like a workbook where you're answering questions, you know, where you're in your analytical yeah. mind, a creative book where you're, you're you know, you're co-creating the book. Yeah. Um, and so part of my platforms are in the form of books and games and journeys. When um, I work live with someone or one-to-one -one or within a group, well, there can be moments where the, I'll suggest that, you know, they doodle, they take a word or whatever, doodle around and see the energy that word, you know, creates for them just to become aware of uh, when they use that word, what energy they're actually infusing in their body and their mind. And, you know, and then we explore how they could maybe choose a different word that's got a better energy or so, so art can come in in different ways. Play can come up in different ways. It all depends on what we're working on, where we're going. And, you know, it's a bit like that, that backpacking adventure. It's sort of, you know, there's no plan. I don't have a, a plan as a to formula. exactly what we do when. It's, you know, we, we go, we take a few steps and then we see, okay, what would be the best game to play right now? You know, maybe we need to invent one. Maybe yeah. we need to get out our pencils. Um, and it just sort of happens and unfolds like that. Uh, but there are certain structures that I use, like the Atlas, you know, identity Atlas or the identity cards, which have a certain purpose for certain things. Um, and so I just keep developing new games and, you know, trying to get them out there as fast as I can uh, as well. Cool. So. so people can buy those like on your website, the Identity Atlas or cards or? So the Identity Atlas and cards, that's for the moment I'm using that more, more in a live setting, okay. um, but I am finishing the games right now and the idea is to make them available uh, for purchase. The There is a book that's out practically um out now uh where people will be able to find a link on my website very shortly um which is which is again it's one of these spaces it's very hard to define it's not a it's, it's a coloring book but it's more than a coloring book it's a you know there's stories in there there are um deep reflections in there it's an invitation to go on this this self-discovery journey there are quotes to doodle around so it's it's much more than just a coloring book to calm, you know, sort of spend a moment of, of calm. And so that's that's coming out um, within the next few days, or might be out by the time this recording is out. So. It's out. I'm I'm sure it's out by the time it's people out. have seen this or listening. Yeah, it's it's out. So so um so yeah, and and I'm also working on a, a parenting game with some co-creation, you know, and some children's books actually are in the pipeline. So it's all about creating these spaces, more and more of these spaces for people to have access to games and tools and spaces to to just connect to who they are and really discover themselves and um, and also you know figure out what doesn't belong to them, right? I think a lot of big part of self-discovery is realizing what is ours and what isn't. Mm. And um, a lot of what we think we are isn't even us, right? So it's lovely to also discover that and then decide, okay, I don't need to take this with me anymore. Right. I can leave that part behind. It's not mine. <laughs> yeah. And how do you help people like leave it behind if they've discovered things that... They don't well, need to carry on. Um, I think I think part of it's probably identifying it. That yeah, there's that. The first thing is always the awareness, right? Because that's why it created the identity atlas. Is because I realized that we identify with so many things um, that aren't ours, but we just because either people told us that we identify with that, or because that's how society is structured. Or, you know, because um, that's where our parents are from. So, you know, and, and I, I created these spaces, these places in the mind where we can go and explore that. 
So, you know, whether it's our emotions, our behavior, the uh, traumatic events, or, or just what, you know, our parents told us, and there's about 20 places like that, and we explore them. And then we really, okay, well, you know, is that really me? Or is that who I learned to be, you mm-hmm. know, through whatever shaping <laughs> was done, right? you know, in order to fit in, in order to be accepted, in order to avoid uh, maybe tension in the family, in order, to, you know, and, and when we identify them, that really is the biggest thing because you, you see, oh, okay, here's, you know, here's the rock. But for me, the next step is really to not say, okay, I, I mean, we can say, I don't want that. It's not mine, but we can also go a step further and say, okay, how does that actually help me now? Like mm-hmm. what, how can I transform that? Yeah. That that experience, that event that, you know, rather than say, I'm just going to drop it. Maybe there's something in there, like in a rock, you know, if you break it open, there might be a gem. So we go and we break it open and say, okay, but, but what has that given you? You know, right. so that you can still somehow be grateful for it rather than, you know, having these more negative feelings towards it and thinking, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and resenting people for, yeah. you know, giving the, the baggage because people usually don't do it intentionally, right? They do it out yeah. of love, they do it out of fear, they do it out of care. Yeah. Um, and so if we can take that and just transform it rather than, resent people for it then we come out the winner right we yeah we come out with growth so that's you know but it all depends of course of what we find and yeah. you know what we're going to do with it it's not there's no there's no there's formula no, right <laughs> definitely i saw on your website you talked about a unity bubble yeah okay what, want to talk about like what that is and so the unity bubble it's um it's it's a very interesting thing it's something that i came across a few years ago um in a spiritual environment because i started exploring you know the inner world and then also the outer world and then the spiritual world and and actually i find that there's a lot of playfulness in the outer world as well you can play with the energies in the outer world um and then then it really becomes fun yeah um and the unity bubble was a tool that was developed um by someone called jonathan davies who has passed away since then and his wife hazel she continues to work with this bubble and it's an energetic tool which allows us to, which is given by transmission, and which is, allows us to release anything that's not in alignment. And you can have the bubble, you can get the bubble and then just sort of, you know, learn to give it things, but you can go through this process of these protocols, which is really about undoing the layers. And what gets interesting here, this for me, this is the ultimate form of play, because now we're not just playing... Um, you know, in our imaginary world and in our inner world, we're actually playing with the outside world. Mm -hmm. And so these seven protocols will address one particular issue that as humans, we've collected, you know, judgment, um, you know, all the, all these things about giving, but not being open to receive and, and all these things. And as we go through that, there will be things that show up in that person's life that, that are there to sort of um, show them, oh, okay, there's something you can do here, you know, to uh, break a pattern that's not serving you, for example, um, so that you can get more into alignment with who you are. And so it's a real, it's a coaching process and it's about seeing those things and and thinking, oh, you know, what could I learn from that situation? So it's taking the life in real time and what's being presented and then um, exploring rather than just repeating the patterns over and over again to look at it through a completely different lens not about the person not about the situation but more about maybe the message right Mm -hmm. what what, how could I use this message to you know overcome a pattern that's not serving me and it's a very very exciting process Um, it's uh, it's. I don't want to say it's a difficult process because for some people it's more difficult than others. It's a very eye-opening process, 
but it can also be a very fun process because all of a sudden you realize that so much is not personal. So much is really just about learning and um, growing. And, yeah. and you, you just learn to distance yourself from these things. And then, and then things really get to be fun. And, you know, you watch it almost like you're watching a movie and thinking, Oh, okay. So, so, you know, this is happening. That's so interesting. Oh, huh, I wonder what I can do with that. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's always difficult to explain because it's such yeah. a, you know, non tangible tool. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like it's like weaved into the to your book and kind of the work that you're doing with play, also just helping people like look at things differently and be on the journey and have different perspectives. Absolutely. For me, it is about, um, it, it's, I mean, you can do it without the bubble as well. And that's what I do, you know, in, in my play sort of uh, spaces. It's about taking a completely different perspective to things and then, and then trying to transform our perception of it, what we take away from it, what we want to do with it. Here, we're just taking it up a level. <laughs> You know, in terms of, uh, um, and, and, you know, it's not for everybody because it depends on, you know, what your beliefs might be and so forth. But, yeah. Um, but the thing is, when you look at the world and yourself through play, it doesn't matter what's real or what's not in the sense of um, the real world. I always find it interesting. You know, we talk about the real world. Yeah. And actually, the real world is a game. You know, society is a game. We've decided on certain rules that we're supposedly, you know, playing with. It's just a game that's not much fun for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. But we can create the model of the world that suits us better. We we have that liberty to create our own vision and perspective of the world. And whether you want to integrate spirituality and energies into that or or other belief systems, that's okay. You know, as long as it serves you and 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 you know what we want to do with it. Because at the end of the day, we're all telling ourselves stories. We're all adopting a model of the world. And yeah. some might adopt a model of the world where everything is against them and people are horrible and, you know, and that's what they're going to create, right? That's that's going to be their life experience. Yeah. But if you if you want to change your vision and play a different game, well, the game will change for you, right? You are the game master to some extent. So, um, so like, it's about exploring those perspectives. Yeah, I think so many people don't feel like they are the game master. Like yeah, they they don't have control or. The ability to shift or yeah. get off the path that they're on that they're like this is where they are and they can't change it but and that's the interesting thing is that we hang on so tight you know i i have this little example my my daughter when she was little we have this um uh neighborhood pool and it's got a little kiddie pool, which is really not deep it's it's you know like for a child it, it, i don't know it's about a foot deep so you think, you know, nothing can happen in that kind of depth. She was wearing little wings and she had a little floaty thingy with these handles on it. So, you know, I was sitting next to her, but, you know, you'd think there's no way that head is gonna ever going to go underwater. What happened was she slipped. And so she sort of got into this, this lying position. She was holding on to this raft thing. And it was like she was holding a lid over her head. Yeah. Okay, and because it had handles, she was hanging on to it because all of a sudden it was she was sort of underwater and didn't know what to do. And I mean, I saw it immediately, but I th thought as well, oh my gosh, you know, this this is how you drown. You hang yeah. on to something that you think is going to save you that you can control, and actually, you're 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 if you just let go of that, yeah. you'd be fine. You'd pop out of the you know. And I think in life. Um, we do that a lot. We hang on to the stuff that's actually keeping our head underwater. Right. And if we just let go for a moment and release a little bit of control and say, okay, I'm just going to surrender to the to the fact that actually I don't control the future and I don't control everything in my life. Um, it's by releasing the control that we actually start floating again. Yeah. And it's by releasing control that we gain control but not a control of saying I I know exactly where I'm going, but just control of our emotional state, of our well-being, of you know how we feel 
Yeah. And it's a tough one because it's such a paradox, right? But but that's what this is all about. And that's what I find so fascinating in the work I do. And it's helped me in my own self-discovery journey, you know, to to bump up against all these messages and these these sort of patterns and having to go through it myself. Yeah. To see how, you know, in my model of the world, these things function and um and seem to function for other people as well. Yeah. So what do you love doing most of all? Um, I, I just love exploring. I just love that, you know, the journey. Yeah. It, it, you know, people often ask me, where do you, you know, well, what's your goal? What's your goal? And I was like, I don't know what my goal is. I just, I don't have a goal, you know? And then I felt I should have a goal. I should set a goal. Do I like that goal? Do I like... And now I've just sort of let go of that and yeah. said, okay, I apparently I'm not a goal person. I'm a journey person. And I love exploring, you know, for myself, the, connecting to my subconscious mind through art. That's so weird. And, you know, you sort of, it's like I go on this journey and I come back with a postcard. It's like, oh, this is what my subconscious mind thinks. That's really interesting. And then going out and, you know, like with the unity bubble, exploring, you know, seeing how yeah. through a transmission, somebody comes back a week later and says, okay, so this happened. That was weird. So, oh, that's so interesting. You know, what, you know, what do you want to make of it? And yeah. going on that journey of exploration and, and just, you know, keep learning about the human mind, the, the, the universe. It's, it's an exploration. I think the moment that I will stop learning and I think that I found everything that's the day I die <laughs> you know and I'm not I'm not in a hurry to get there so I'm yeah. just going <laughs> to continue to enjoy the journey <laughs> definitely definitely so let's tell people where they can find your book and find information about you we're okay. going to have that link in the show notes yeah so um they can go on my website nicolewitower.com or mapsoflife.com with hyphens between the words um, and there, there's a, there's a tab, a menu about the books and the games, and um, I'm sure that yeah, it the, the from there on they can then either go on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or different places wherever they want to um, buy the book from. Awesome. And, um, stay tuned to other things that you know are going to be showing up. Definitely, definitely. So, um. What advice would you give other women that are considering like going into business, being an entrepreneur, stepping out of yeah. stepping off the path that they're on? Um I think there'd be there'd be three things I'd I'd suggest is one is to give themselves permission to play. Okay. Because when we go on this thing, we have these expectations and we're so stressed out about making it work and so forth. And and even if you just sort of think about the word, you know, try, like, oh, I'm going to try to succeed. I'm going to try this. There's so much tension in that word. There's so much pressure. And there's also so much fear of not succeeding in the word try, because if it, you thought it was easy, you know, it's like difficulty. Try means there's difficulty ahead. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd just do it. I wouldn't try it. Yeah. But if you just even tell yourself, I'm going to play with it, okay? I'm going to explore that. All of a sudden, you're removing the expectation. You say, okay, this is, a, this is an experiment. I'm going to play with that and see what happens. And if, you know, I don't like where that's going, I'm going to play with a different option or I'm going to play. But if they can stay in that space of experimentation and play, um. I think that they, they're really going to go faster in different places and find things that that are going to make their experience richer, discover people that they weren't expecting to meet and, you know, maybe go on a different path, but but a better one. Usually if you if you meet other paths, it's because it's a better path. You, do, you don't choose a worse path. You choose a better one. But if you yeah. don't see the path, you just stay on the one you're on, right? Um, the second thing I'd say is surround yourself with playmates, right? <laughs> that don't force their game upon you. Yeah. Their game, their rules, you know, their better knowledge and so forth. But playmates who 
are also exploring and who want to help you explore what you're doing, you know, to, to, to tickle things out of you rather than, you know, you don't want to bully <laughs> as a playmate. Yeah. Right. You, you want a proper playmate. And, um, and the third sort of, uh, I always work in visuals, so it's more of this this visual interpretation of if you imagine yourself playing on a playground. At the end of the day, if you go home with clean clothes and not a scratch on you, you haven't played, right? Ooh. So, um, you know, give yourself permission to get dirty and and go home with a scratch, and you know, and fall on your face a couple of times. If you've got good playmates with you, they're going to help, you know, they're going to give you a hug and they're going to give you a Band-Aid. It's not going to hurt any less because it's not their pain, but it'll feel like at least, you know, um, you're loved and and you can continue. And so, um, you know, we make such a big deal out of failure, even if we keep saying, oh, failures are the failures are the, you know, stepping stones to success. Um, I like to look at it you know, always through the lens of play. Yeah. And when, when I think of that, you know, then it doesn't make it feel so bad, so serious. It's like, ah, oh, it's normal. Like, I mean, when I was a kid, I loved getting dirty. Yeah. <laughs> My <laughs> knees were black and blue all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and, and it was fun. That's what play was about. And I think if we can just embrace that as adults, then we take so much pressure off and so much, you know, energy that goes into stress and worries and that just sort of dissipates. And then we can really explore and see where we want to go. So those, those would be the things I'd, I'd suggest. Thank you. Very cool. I love the metaphor. It's a great <laughs> visual just to think of that playground and like, yeah, get muddy. Get just dirty. get muddy and play, get dirty and, 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 you know, and if you got to scream at the top of your lungs every once in a while, well, make some noise. You know, I yeah. mean, it's, uh, yeah. We use a similar thing with biking. It's like if if our bikes come back clean, like have we really been out? <laughs> yeah. And they say the same thing about skiing. If you if you don't fall at least once when you're out and you haven't actually skied, like you've just been sliding. Like yeah. you, you haven't put your... <laughs> That's all I do you know. skiing is fall. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah yeah i i love metaphors um they just help me that visual like helps me to picture it and it yeah it's great just giving people a different picture of of that is incredible and then giving them also permission to create their own pictures right yeah. like i think there's a lot more people out there that are really visual but we're so used to having to learn in this very um, academic way with textbooks and lots of words. And and that's that works for a certain part of the population, but we don't all function that way. Yeah. And, you know, they say a picture says a thousand words. And I think a lot of people, most people, if they could have a diagram or a picture or an image in their mind that, you know, resonates with something that's being explained in the book, it, it first of all, it goes so much faster. And second of all, like when we talk about a playground, it's an emotional thing, right? Oh, it's not yeah. just it's not just the visual. It's I'm back in my childhood. I'm I'm I can see my blue knees and I can feel how I felt then. And oh yeah, I can play. I was courageous. I I'd climb up trees and on on rocks and so forth. I'm not afraid. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're connecting to that courage, right? Yeah. And so I've I find that that world so much more engaging because and that's also why i play with with people and teams and so forth it's because it's an emotional experience it's an emotional experience where you've already succeeded just by going through the experience you're not learning something theoretically that you then have to put into practice and then you still have that barrier of saying oh i don't know if i can do that well you just did because you just played so you don't right. have to worry about that anymore you, you yeah. just, it's already it's already done. It's already been integrated in your body and your cells. And all you have to do is do it again. Yeah. I call that whole body learning. Like yeah. your your whole body is learning the lesson or whatever it is. And it's incredible. Yeah. Well, so. I want to thank you so much for being here. This has been so much fun talking about play and how to integrate it and 
I'm excited to get your book because it sounds really cool. So I hope it comes. Well, now that it people is are out. listening to this, it's out. It's out. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank so, you so much for having me. It's been so much fun. I I love having such a conversation. It's been a great space. Well, thank you. I encourage people to visit Nicole's websites. The links are in the show notes, NicoleWidower.com and maps of life with hyphens in between the words.com um, to get more information, to be in touch with her and to um, get her books. And they are incredible. So thanks again for being here. And um, thank you for having me. It's been a lovely, lovely afternoon. Great. Hey, thank you for being with me today on this incredible, incredible episode with Nicole Whitauer, a visionary artist and play enthusiast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You could tell that I believe that this is an important thing as business leaders and womenpreneurs for us to spend some time focusing on. Some of the key takeaways that I heard is play is not just for children, and sometimes we as adults lose touch with our playful side, which disconnects us from our inner knowledge and wisdom. So reconnecting with play can lead to more fulfilling and aligned life experience by fostering exploration, courageousness, experimentation. Key takeaway number two is that we all have to try to embrace the unknown and be open to new experiences. Instead of focusing solely on reaching a predetermined destination, be willing to take risks, experiment, explore without expectation. By doing so, you're going to uncover new and exciting paths, making your journey all the more interesting and fulfilling. I want to extend a big thank you to our guest, Nicole Widower, for sharing their, her wisdom and insights with us today. I encourage you to go pick up her book. It is incredible. I have it here, and I am so excited to dive into it, and um, I encourage you to go pick that book up as well, and the link is in the show notes. If you have a chance, I also encourage you to subscribe to our podcast. The more people we have listening, the better, right? Leave us a review. That would be awesome on whatever your favorite podcasting platform is. You can hear us all over the internet. And if you haven't picked up the Visionary Women Printers Field Guide yet, be sure to grab that field guide at compassersconsulting.com backslash field dash guide and download it today and get started. It's actually inside the members area at Compassers Consulting. So there's some other things that you can get in there as well. And... I look forward to seeing you next time on Visionary Women Printers Podcast. Be sure to visit our show page over at compassersconsulting.com backslash radio. You can find all the episodes there as well as how to become a guest on the show. Until then, visualize the future, envision great things, and then go out and make